Good morning. Well, as you can tell, pastor's not here this morning. Him and Kathy are out at their home church. They're having their 100th or something anniversary, and they were out for that. So that's where they're at this weekend. Uh, they'll be back this next week and everything, go from there. So uh, Tim Kirsten, who just rang the bell, and I are going to do the service and so forth. So with that, let's go our opening hymn. Uh, Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, o Lord, but with you there is forgiveness. You Hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. For your great name's sake, O Lord, for my iniquity, for its sake, and cleanse us from the guilt of our sins, lead us back on the The work of God is that you believe in him whom he has sent. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given to us his only Son to suffer and die for our salvation. And for his sake, God forgives all children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May he who began this good work in you bring it to completion on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, have mercy upon us. O Christ, have mercy upon us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. And Let us pray. All powerful God, by his dying and rising, your son Jesus defeated Satan and has freed us from sin's prison. Fill us with your word and spirit to stand strong against Satan's attacks, strengthening us to do your will. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 3. 
They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The word of the Lord. Our epistle reading this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believe so that I so and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake so that as grace extends to you, or extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent, which is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the third chapter. Then Jesus went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first first binds the strong man, then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him, and a crowd was sitting around him. And they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my brothers, my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Thanks be to God. Uh, We'll continue our service with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated uh, as we sing our hymn of the day, number 528. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, we seek your comfort this day. We have so many concerns or worries. Help us through the words that you have given us in the scriptures and through the sermon today. Help us to hear, to hear you, and to know that you will always be with us, no matter how the day may be going. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our sermon today is based upon the gospel reading from Mark. He stood up in his chair and walked to the door of the pastor's office. The pastor thought he was going to leave. But instead, he stopped, put his hand on the light switch. He turned and asked, Is it okay if I turn out the lights? I'm too ashamed of what I have to say. There in the darkness of the church office, with only light coming through the dim glow of the outside lights, he told the pastor how lonely he had been since his divorce, how he had felt so alone in the world, and how he had sinned against his brother in the most grievous way. 
Pastor, can God ever forgive me, he asked. In our gospel reading today, Jesus has been dealing with divided houses and kingdoms. He is either terrifying or comforting, depending on who you are. This is not that surprising since even today, Jesus' name is still terrifying or comforting. In the category of terrifying, there are two ways Jesus is terrifying to people in today's gospel. First, he is terrifying to his family because he's embarrassing to them. When Jesus went to his hometown in Nazareth, where he had been raised as a child, the crowd gathered around him and his disciples so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard this, they went out to seize Jesus, saying, He is out of his mind. If Jesus wanted to travel around the Sea of Galilee with a bunch of fishermen and zealots, tax collectors, and other undesirables, that was his own business. But to bring them to his hometown, where his mother and brothers lived, to talk about the kingdom of God and the repentance of sins, how embarrassing. He must be out of his mind. And what sorts of people did Jesus have gathered around him? Who would have been in this crowd that gathered so close? Over and over again, we hear that the crowds gathered around Jesus included those people, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the sick, even those with leprosy. So Jesus comes back to his hometown with 12 diamonds in the rough, and suddenly a crowd of all the people, with all their struggles in plain sight, flock to him. How mortifying for Jesus' family. How they must have been embarrassed for Mary and Joseph. They had to get Jesus out of the middle of that circus and make some kind of excuse for him. Maybe they could say he's out of his mind. So like Jesus' family is mortified, embarrassed, and humiliated in their own town. What a way to have it. Secondly, Jesus is terrifying to the scribes who came down from Jerusalem. These men were equivalent to professors. They were academics, literate, and professional teachers. They acted as lawyers and judges. They made old copies of the Old Testament for use in the Jewish synagogues and in the temple. They knew the law inside and out. They were some of the brightest and the best. Our gospel lessons say that they came down from Jerusalem. What would drive these kind of men to travel for six days on foot to go down to Jerusalem or to Nazareth? You have to be very angry or upset to commit to that kind of expenditure of time and energy. What was it that was terrifying them when it came to Jesus? When they faced the crowd, they put forward a suspicion that Jesus had an unclean spirit. This accusation was an attack on Jesus using Old Testament law that everyone knew. This man, Jesus, was connected to John the Baptist, who was a source of consternation for the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. The scribes had noticed that this Jesus, who was baptized by John, had lived in the wilderness for 40 days and was now teaching in the synagogue. Word spread among the scribes that this Jesus was casting out demons that, uh, from people that were possessed, that he heals the sick, that he forgives sins. All of these things should not be happening by the hand of some carpenter's son from Nazareth. We hear in John chapter 1, Nazareth, can anything come from there? Especially not the forgiveness of sins. That was given only by the Levitical priesthood to the temple in Jerusalem, under the watchful eye of the high priest in the Sanhedrin. What a terrifying thought that forgiveness of sins could come from this man from Nazareth, Jesus. They had to get Jesus out of the business of forgiving people's sins, out of the middle of that circus of poor and undesirables. Maybe if they said that Jesus is possessed by Beelzebub and that by the prince of demons he cast out demons, Maybe that would work. The people would abandon this Jesus. And after things settled down, everything would go back to normal. 
They needed to get everything back to the Old Testament temple and law. So there they were. The scribes are scared, angry, terrified, because they could not deny that Jesus was, in fact, healing the sick and casting out demons. They could only deny and call into question by what means he was doing all of those mir these miracles. This is a good spot to look at what Jesus says about all of this. He says, Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven of the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never have forgiveness, but is guilty of eternal sin. Notice the two groups. The first group finds forgiveness. The second does not. In the context of our gospel reading today, the first group is Jesus' family. The second is the scribes. His family directed their comments at Jesus alone. The scribes are calling into question by what, Jesus, the spirit, by what spirit Jesus does what he does. Their attack is actually against the Holy Spirit. With his family, the judgment that Jesus has gone out of his mind is blasphemy, an outrageous and demeaning thing to say about him who is the Son of God. This will be forgiven, though, because it is false judgment that simply fails to recognize who Jesus truly is. With the scribes, the danger is much greater. By contrast, the scribes contend that Jesus is working with Satan. These opponents reject our Lord, but more importantly, they assert that the work of God's Spirit in Jesus is the work of Satan, work that must be opposed and ultimately destroyed. If the evidence and character of Jesus carries with it a certain level of ambiguity, there is no such ambiguity in the work of the Holy Spirit in this same Jesus. As he heals and casts out the unclean spirits, he also brings the good news of God's grace and undeserved gifts of love and rescue. <coughs> Those who see <clears throat> those who see such works as evil, as do the scribes, align themselves with the evil one and with him who stands condemned. This is what Jesus is driving at when he says, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Division and conflict seem to be pre prevalent in Jesus' family and in the religious community. Division and conflict is the reality of today's world and our lives. A nation divided results in venomous politics and extreme civil actions towards others. An economy divided yields poverty and injustice. A community divided brings out individualism and tribalism, prejudice and violence. Humanity divided is all these things on a global level but faith divi divided is sin. We all know what it is like to live divided lives. You know those times when your outsides and your insides don't match up. That's what it means to be a house divided. You are one person at work, another at home. You act at one way with some people and a different way with other people. Life gets divided into pieces. Behavior, beliefs, ethics become situational. There is the work life, the family life, the spiritual life, the personal life, the social life, and so many more. Pretty soon, we're left with a bunch of pieces. It seems that we are forever trying to put the pieces of our lives together. That's why the crowd was, has gathered around Jesus. That's why the religious authorities opposed him. That's why his family tries to restrain him. In their own way, each is trying to put the pieces of their life together, but it is not working. They won't fit together anymore. They have been found out. Their lives and their worlds are neither what they thought they were or what Jesus knows they could be. One reality has fallen, and a new one is ready to rise. 
Jesus always stands before us as the image of unity, of wholeness, integrity. He is the stronger one. He does for us which we cannot do for ourselves. He puts our lives and houses back in order. Jesus offers a different image of what life might look like. He does so by revealing the division in our lives, the houses that cannot stand, and the crumbling of our kingdoms. Even when it is for our own good, with the offer of new life and wholeness, that's a hard place to be. It means that one way or another, there will be change of some sort. Most of us don't like that. It can be frightening. He has gone out of his mind, the people say. The religious authorities accuse him of being in alliance with Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. They projected onto Jesus their own interior conflicts and divisions. They have declared that which is holy, sacred, and beautiful to be unclean, dirty, and ungodly. Their accusations say more about themselves than Jesus. Their accusations reveal the depth of the conflict and division within them. Their accusations are a way of avoiding themselves. It's hard to look at the division and inner conflict within our own lives. The beginning of wholeness, however, is acknowledging our brokenness. Here, then, is the good news for us today. Anyone who at times has had ideas and beliefs about Jesus that are unscriptural, there is forgiveness for them. If that is you, there is forgiveness for you. Jesus forgave his family. He will likewise forgive us. If someone doesn't have all of their ducks in a row and they are in error, forgiveness is for them. Outside the one true faith, the Christian faith, this is likewise true. Jesus gives forgiveness to them as much as it is for anyone. Today's gospel is also a grave warning to those who would defame God by knowingly misrepresenting him to others, spreading falsehoods that Jesus is possessed by the devil and not full of the Holy Spirit is false and damning to those people. It's hard to look at the division and inner conflict within our own lives. The beginning of wholeness, however, is acknowledging our brokenness. There are all sorts of forces, things, events, and sometimes even people by which our lives are broken and through which we are separated from God. Christ is stronger than our fragmented lives. He binds the forces that divide, heals the wounds that separate, and refashions the pieces into a whole new life. There is nothing about our lives that cannot be put back together by the love of God in Christ. So what should the pastor say to the man whose sin was so dark that he had to shut off the lights in order to tell him his story? More important, what does Jesus Christ say? He says, God forgives all sins. Your sin is forgiven. To those who are gathered around Jesus, he is not a terror, but a comfort. We know he truly provides the peace that comes with forgiveness of sins, with the promise of eternal life, with the love that reaches out and heals. The Lord gives us compassion and kindness when the world is hard and unforgiving. Jesus does the same for us. He took our sins to the cross and sacrificed himself for what we cannot do. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in true faith in our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We stand for the offertory hymn.
Almighty God, grant us your peace on earth, that there would be an end to warfare and violence, that our civil and social leaders would govern wisely, and that they would defend the poor, the fatherless, and the widows. O Lord, our God, Holy Lord, we give you thanks for the faithful confessors of your church, both today and in ages past, and especially for our fathers in the faith who wrote and presented the Osberg Confession before officials of the church and state. Grant us faith and courage so to believe and boldly confess Jesus Christ in our day, preserving the pure gospel of your grace. Grant to us unwavering commitment to teach further generations your holy scriptures and truth-filled doctrines that all of us may be firmly grounded in one holy faith. O Lord, our God, Gracious Father, empower your holy church, her pastors and her people, to boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. We call upon you to soften hearts, open eyes and ears, and graciously draw all men, women, and children unto yourself through the person and saving work of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grant your grace to our congregation that we may faithfully minister the word and holy sacraments, that we, we may worship you faithfully in spirit and truth, and that we may share Jesus' love with all in whom we encounter. O Lord, our God, great physician of body and soul, grant healing to those who are ill, comfort all who mourn, give hope to the downtrodden, justice to the oppressed, and grace to all who suffer. O Lord, our God. Holy Father, who dwells in unapproachable light and eternal communion with the Son and the Holy Spirit, unto your everlasting care and mercy we entrust your request. Con confident in your grace, hopeful in your mercy, and trusting in your unfailing love, to you be all glory now and forever. Teach us to say your prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated as we continue with our next hymn, number 526.
please stand for prayer. Almighty God, grant to your church your Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes down from above, that your word may not be bound, but have free course and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith we may serve you and, in the confession of your name, abide until the end through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Please be seated for our closing hymn. There, I'm good with that. One of those things that comes into play when you read through the sermons and so forth like those, so much during our day, I don't know about you guys, but so much during the day we get nipped at and little things get pulled away from us. That's when we need to go study the Word some more. Find something to read, find something that comes up on your phone, those types of things. It's amazing how the devil works little ways to drag into our lives chaos, all sorts of pains and so forth. So with that... Keep everybody in your prayers. Thank you.